ladies and gentlemen, and young friends. I feel really beholden such an unexpected glory having been bestowed on me, which I think I didn't deserve. At the same time, I must say that I am extremely obliged to Ravi Kumarji who gave me the opportunity to be here amidst you and to enjoy the benefits of this conference. the last 61 years and uh, in a way I have started quite a few trends. You might term me as hopelessly out of date but some of my friends believe that I still hold a place in the academia. My theme is translation is part of education. In the globalized world, unless we are looking for a brutal homogeneity with multifarious languages, the need for translation is both natural and useful. Practitioners like Franz Zahn, 1796 1865, and H. G. Ollendorf, 1803 to 1865, the former a German schoolmaster and the latter another German used an easy and practical method, the grammar translation method. And it helped teach a number of European languages. The English teachers modified the German method in accordance with the requirements of middle class education in their schools. The above Anglo German grammar translation method was readily accepted in India in the late 19th century. But looking back at it now, it appears that though partially successful, it did not survive thanks to the neglect of the spoken content of language. The natural line of action, therefore, later on, should have been to complement and supplement it with a view to removing its deficiencies. On the other hand, what followed was an unabashed display of newer methods, most of them coming with an academic veneer, but underlying them was an unquenchable thirst for more and more profits from the colonies, particularly India, which provided the largest and most lucrative market of new English courses. Of course, in the perpetuation of this diabolical plan, Indian dons of colleges and universities who were themselves the products of colonial education, also played a prominent part. Aping of the West became a national pastime. Ruth Clark, in the chapter Adult Theories, Child Strategies and Their Implications for the Language Teacher, in the third volume of the Edinburgh course on Applied Linguistics, has something very interesting to say in this regard. Under the caption, should first language and translation be used in the classroom? I quote him extensively. The problem here is whether direct use of first language is a help or hindrance when the second language is being taught. Let's see whether reference to various theoretical approaches and to the experience of first language teaching can help clarify this issue. If we accept to apply stimulus response theory to the question of translation, we get tangled in a web of conflicting arguments. For instance, we may reason that in learning to produce words in the new language, the learner is acquiring an additional set of responses to stimuli which originally only elicited responses in the native language. Two sets of responses to the same stimuli have to be kept quite distinct if they are not to interfere with one another. 
This seems to be the argument which has influenced people who are opposed to the use of first language in the classroom. However, one could also reason that when it comes to learning the meaning of words in a new language, the first language can be very helpful since the learner need not repress his habitual responses but may simply transfer each of the RMS response communication and stimulus he already has to an additional stimulus. The learning of lists of translation equivalents could be one method of achieving this. But this will only work if words are exact translation equivalents in the two languages. For otherwise, the RMS would not be capable of being transferred. This shows that we have to take account of the relationship between the two languages at a deeper level in terms of whether they wrap up the word into similar stimulus bundles. It is not sufficient to think simply in terms of substituting one response for another or one stimulus for another. What light can the study of first language acquisition throw on the question of whether to use translation in the second language classroom? Perhaps very little, since there is no possibility of a first language being taught via the medium of any other language. However, the study of first language acquisition does show us that a child will construe novel events in terms of the conceptual systems already available to him. It is unlikely, therefore, that even if we wanted to eliminate the effect of the first language on the learning of a second, the banishment of overt verbal stimuli from the classroom would have the desired effect. There seems then to be no theoretical objection to utilizing the student's native language in second language learning, indeed making the learner more aware of things he knows implicitly about his own language may be one of the most useful devices available to the language teacher. Now, respecting the time limit, I shan't read the rest of it, but I'll give you only a sample. I, in fact, had two samples. One of teaching classroom English grammar to the bilingual method, and the other a piece of translation. I read out the piece of translation to you, since the day has the flavor of translation today. Jaliya wala khan or mahilayan. सन उन्नीस सौ उन्नीस का आरंभ जलियावाला कांड की संक्षिप्त पृष्ठभूमि शुरू में युद्ध प्रयत्नों के बिना शर्त सहयोग प्रदान करने की गांधी जी की नीति थी इस सिलसिले में मदद करने के लिए जब वह पुनः खेड़ा गए तो उन्हें उन्नीस के खेड़ा सत्याग्रह के दिनों के विपरीत अनुभव हुआ पूर्व सत्याग्रह में सहयोगी लोग इस बार रू, रंग रूटों की भर्ती के मामले में असहयोगी बन गए अंग्रेजों के जुल्मों से उत्पन्न इस जन असंतोष को गांधी जी ने लक्ष्य किया भारत रक्षा कानून युद्ध समाप्ति के छह महीने बाद समाप्त हो जाने वाला था इसलिए अंग्रेजी सरकार ने दंडात्मक निषेधात्मक दोनों प्रकार की ताकत हथियाने के लिए दमनकारी कानून रॉयल टैक्ट लाने की कोशिश की और उसके विरोध में गांधी जी ने 30 मार्च को देश भर में हड़ताल की घोषणा कर दी बाद में हड़ताल का दिल बदल कर छह अप्रैल कर दिया गया था सारे भारत के नगरों में गाँव में हड़ताल हुई हिंदू मुस्लिम एकता के कारण ये हड़ताल को सफल भी रही ट्रांसलेशन दूवर जलिया वाला इंसिडेंट इन ब्रिमिन इट वॉज द बिगिनिंग ऑफ नाइनटीन नाइनटीन लेट्स है बैकग्राउंड टू द अब इंसिडेंट In the beginning, Gandhiji's policy was to extend unconditional support to the British in the war effort. When he again went to Kerala to render help for the war cause, he experienced something quite contrary to that of the days of 1917 Kerala Satyagraha. Those who had cooperated with him in that earlier Satyagraha turned hostile in the matter of recruiting new people. Gandhiji focused. on this people's discontent caused by the tyranny of the british defense of india law was to come to an end 6 months after the cessation of war therefore the british government in order to grab both penal and preventive powers tried to erect the oppressive rule act against which gandhi gave a call 
for a nationwide strike on 30th March. Later, the day of strike was changed to 6th April. There was a strike in all towns and villages of Bharat and it was very successful thanks to Hindu Muslim unity. Well, friends, I leave my copy of the paper here. I have uh, tried this method, as I said, for six decades and the excellent results. We can teach English and the only procedure that one should adopt anywhere in the world is the bilingual method. The reason why the British scholars stood up against this was because they were not bilingual and the whole shop will have to be wound down. We must now understand this conspiracy. We must revert to our national glory. And we must call a spade a spade. In the end, sir, I must thank you very much indeed for having called me and having bestowed on me this glorious award. Thank you very much.